Heidi, by Joanna Spirey. From the old and pleasantly situated town of Meinfeld, a path leads through green, shady meadows to the foot of the mountains, which look down from their majestic heights upon the valley below. As the footpath begins to slope gently upwards, the fragrance of the nearby heath, with its short grass and vigorous mountain plants, fills the air. Then the way becomes more rugged. And the path rises steeply towards the Alps. One bright sunny morning in June, a tall, sturdy-looking girl of this mountainous country climbed the narrow mountain path, leading a child by the hand. She wore two, if not three, frocks, one on top of the other, and in addition, a big red shawl was tied all round her body, so that her little five-year-old figure was scarcely discernible. The two figures had been climbing from the valley for about an hour, when they reached the hamlet called Dorfli, which is situated halfway up the Alm. Here they were greeted with friendly calls from every doorway, for this was the girl's birthplace. But she hurried on until she had reached the last of the scattered little houses, and as she passed, a voice called from the doorway, "Wait for me, Dieti, if you're going up, and I'll come too." She stood still. A stout, kind-looking woman came out of the house and joined them. "Where are you taking the child, Dieti?" she asked. "I suppose it's your sister's child, the orphan." "Yes," answered Dieti. "I am taking her to stay with the Alm uncle." "Surely you aren't going to leave the child with him? You must be out of your mind, Dieti." "He's her grandfather. I have looked after the child up to now, and I can tell you, Barbel, I am not going to turn down the offer of a good job on her account." From now on, the grandfather will have to do his bit. She looked round to see whether the child were nearby, but the little one was not in sight. I see her! cried Barbel at last. Over there! She pointed far away from the path. She is climbing the slopes with Peter, the goat herd, and his goats. Well, I wouldn't like to be the child. She went on disapprovingly. Nobody knows anything about the old man up there. He never speaks to anybody. With his bushy eyebrows and his terrible beard, he looks a positive savage. The whole village is afraid of him. Still, Dieti persisted. He is the grandfather, and it's up to him to look after the child. I have almost come as far as I need," answered Barbel. "I want to speak to Peter's grandmother. She spins for me in winter. Good bye then, Dieti, and good luck." Dieti shook her friend's hand. And stopped while Barbel walked towards the little brown alm hut, which was situated in a sheltered spot some yards off the path. The hut was more than halfway up the alm from the village. It was fortunate it stood in such a sheltered place, for it looked dilapidated beyond repair. The goat herd lived here with his mother and his old blind grandmother. Peter was eleven years old. Every morning he collected goats from the village and drove them up to the alm. Where they grazed till evening. Dieti stood looking impatiently in all directions to catch a glimpse of the children and the goats, but they had taken a very roundabout way. At first, the little girl had toiled hard to climb with the goat herd, panting in the heat and making a great effort under the heavy encumbrance of clothes. She did not say a word, but looked steadily, now at Peter, who jumped about on his bare feet. Now at the goats, who climbed still more easily on their slender little legs, suddenly the child sat down on the ground and quickly removed her shoes and stockings. Then, standing up, she began to take off her many layers of clothing until, clad only in her light little petticoat, she stood with her little bare arms stretched happily into the air. The child, feeling free at last, began to chatter to the boy, asking him how many goats he had, where he was going with them, and what he would do there. So at last the children arrived at the cottage, and caught sight of Aunt Dieti. She no sooner spotted the group than she cried, "Heidi, what a sight you are! Where are your clothes and the new shoes I bought you and the stockings I knitted? Where have you put them?" The child quietly pointed down the hill. "I didn't need them," she said. The aunt followed the direction of her finger. There was indeed something lying on the ground. You dreadful girl! She cried in great annoyance. Now run back and collect them. 
Thus, in three quarters of an hour, the little group reached the top of the elm, where the old uncle's cottage stood on a ledge of the mountain. Along the side of the cottage, facing the valley, the uncle had made himself a bench, and here he now sat, puffing his pipe, both hands on his knees, calmly watching the children, the goats, and Aunt Deetie as they climbed. Heidi arrived first. She went straight up to the old man, stretched out her hand towards him, and said, Good evening, Grandfather. Well, well, what is the meaning of this? asked the old man gruffly. He took the child's hand abruptly, and as he did so, a long piercing glance shot from beneath his bushy eyebrows. Heidi returned his look without blinking. In the meantime, the aunt and Peter had arrived. I wish you a good day, said Dee Dee shortly. This is Tobias and Adelheid's child. You will hardly recognize her because you have not seen her since she was a year old. You there, the old man called to Peter. Take yourself off with your goats. You are late as it is. Peter obeyed at once, for the uncle had given him an angry look, which did not make him wish to linger. The child just has to stay with you, uncle, said Dee Dee. I have done my bit for four years. Now it's your turn. Indeed, mumbled the old man, his glance flashing at Dee Dee. And if the child starts fretting for you, what shall I do with her then? That's up to you, replied Dee Dee. No one told me what to do with the little one when she was left in my care, and only one year old, too. Now I have to make my own living. You are the child's nearest relative. If you can't look after her, it's your responsibility, and you must answer for any harm that comes to her. And I shouldn't think you can afford to add another to your list of wicked deeds. At her last words, the old man got up. He looked so threatening that she took a step backwards. Flinging out his arm, he shouted at her, be off! And don't be in a hurry to show your face here again! Dee Dee did not need a second telling. Goodbye then, she said hurriedly. And you too, Heidi! And with that, she turned and ran all the way back to Dorfley. Long after Dee Dee had gone, the grandfather sat silently, blowing clouds of smoke from his pipe, while Heidi began to inspect her new surroundings. She peeped into the goat house and then walked round to the other side of the cottage, where there stood three old fir trees. A strong wind shook their thick branches, and the child stood still, listening to the moaning of the wind in the ancient trees. Then she completed the circuit of the cottage, and returned to where the grandfather sat. He got up suddenly and said, Come, and bring your bundle of clothes. I don't need them any more, declared Heidi. The old man turned and looked searchingly at the child. She doesn't lack sense anyway, he said quietly to himself. Then, why don't you need them any more? he asked aloud. I would rather be dressed like the goats, with their bare legs. All right then, but bring the things, commanded the grandfather. We will put them in the cupboard. Heidi obediently picked up her bundle and followed the old man inside. The door opened directly onto a big room, which was the full breadth of the cottage. The only furniture in the room was a table and a chair. In one corner stood the grandfather's bed, and in the opposite wall was the fireplace, above which hung a big kettle. On the same side as the bed, in the middle of the wall, there was a door which the grandfather now opened. This was the cupboard where he kept his belongings. On a shelf lay a couple of shirts, socks, and some rough sackcloth sheets. On another stood plates, cups, and glasses, and on the top shelf there was a round loaf, a sausage, ham, and cheese. As soon as the door was opened, Heidi came forward and pushed her own clothes as far behind the grandfather's as possible, so that they would be well out of the way. Then she turned her attention to the room and asked, Where shall I sleep, grandfather? Wherever you want to. This seemed to please the child, and she began to inspect every corner. By the grandfather's bed, wooden steps went up, and when the child climbed the little ladder, she found herself in the hayloft. A bale of hay, fresh and sweet-smelling, lay on the floor, and from a little window in the roof she could see far down into the valley. Oh, 
oh, this is where I should like to sleep, she cried joyfully. It's lovely. Come and see how lovely it is, Grandfather. I have seen it before, came from below. I'm going to make my bed, the child called again, and ran busily to and fro. After a while, the Grandfather went to the cupboard and raked about amongst the clothes. Presently, he pulled out a long, coarse piece of sackcloth, which might serve as a sheet. He carried it up to the loft, and there he saw that a very nice little bed had been made amongst the hay, with extra hay piled up into a pillow at one end, and arranged in such a way that whoever lay on the improvised bed would be able to look up at the little window. Well done, exclaimed the grandfather. Now the sheet goes on, but wait. And here he took a big bunch of hay and made the bed twice as thick so that the hardness of the floor would not come through. Heidi stood admiringly before her new sleeping place. It's just perfect, she declared ecstatically. Oh, I wish it were night time already so that I could go to sleep on it. I think we should eat first, the grandfather advised. In her eagerness, Heidi had forgotten everything except the new bed, but now, when she thought of it, she did indeed feel very hungry, for she had had nothing to eat since morning. Yes, I think so too, she agreed. Well then, since we are in such complete agreement, let's go down, said the old man, quickly guiding the child towards the stairs. In the room below, he went over to the fireplace, pushed back the big kettle, and brought a little one forward on the chain. Then he sat down on a three-legged stool and blew up the fire. It was soon blazing merrily, and the little kettle began to boil. Next, the old man cut a big piece of cheese, and piercing it with a long iron fork, he held it over the fire, turning it constantly to and fro until it was golden brown all over. Heidi had watched all these operations with the closest attention. There was the sound of a shrill whistle. Heidi stood still, and the grandfather stepped out of the cottage. From above, the goats came jumping like wild creatures, and in the midst of them was Peter. With a joyful cry, Heidi rushed to welcome her old friends of the morning. At the cottage, the children and animals came to a halt, and two pretty slender goats, one brown, one white, ran from the herd towards the grandfather. Eagerly they licked his hands, for in the palms he held a little salt, which the goats liked very much. Peter disappeared with the rest of the flock, and Heidi fell to caressing first one and then the other of the goats and jumped gaily round them. Do they belong to us, Grandfather? Do they really belong to us? she asked. Will they stay in the little shed? Do they always stay with us? Heidi scarcely gave the Grandfather a chance to put in his steady, yes, yes, between one question and the next. When the goats had finished licking the salt from his hands, the old man commanded, Go fetch your little bowl and the bread and cheese. Heidi obeyed at once. Then the grandfather milked the white goat into the little bowl, which was soon full to the brim. He cut a piece of bread and, handing it to the child, said, Eat now, and then go upstairs to sleep. I have to tie up the goats for the night. Sleep well. Good night, grandfather. What are the goats' names? Tell me, Grandfather, cried the child, running behind the old man's receding figure. The white one is called Little Swan, and the brown one is Little Bear, the Grandfather called over his shoulder. Good night, Little Swan. Good night, Little Bear, cried Heidi happily, as all three disappeared into the goat house. Heidi went back to the bench outside the cottage, where she sat and took her bread and milk. Then she went into the house and upstairs to bed, where she was soon fast asleep, as soundly and happily as though on the best feather bed. Not long after, and before the darkness had come completely, the grandfather too had gone to bed, for he always rose at sunrise. All night long the wind blew strongly, so that the whole cottage seemed to shake and every beam cracked and groaned. In the middle of the night, the grandfather rose, saying half aloud to himself, Perhaps she's afraid. He climbed the steps and stood by Heidi's bed. Her cheeks were flushed from sleep, and her head rested quietly and peacefully on her little round arms. 
Her dreams appeared to be happy ones, for a smile played about her mouth. The grandfather gazed at the sleeping child until the moon was again overshadowed. Then he turned away in the darkness and went back to his bed. Early in the morning, Heidi was awakened by a loud whistle. As she opened her eyes, a gleam of sunshine came through the little window onto her bed and shone on the hay nearby, so that everything was bathed in golden light. Quickly she jumped out of bed and in a few minutes had dressed herself. Then she climbed down the steps and ran out to the front of the cottage. Peter, the goat herd, was already there with his flock, and the grandfather was leading out little swan and little bear to join them. Heidi ran forward to say good morning to him and to the goats. How would you like to go with them to the pasture? asked the grandfather. Heidi was overjoyed. That was the thing that she would like best of all. The grandfather went into the cottage, calling to Peter. Come here, goat general, and bring your rucksack. Amazed, Peter answered the grandfather's call and laid down the rucksack in which he carried his meagre lunch. Open it, ordered the old man, and then put in a big piece of bread and an equally big piece of cheese. And now the little bowl has to go in too, the old man continued. At lunchtime you will milk for her two little bowlfuls. Take care she doesn't fall over the precipice. Now off you go. Happily the children climbed up the elm. The high winds during the night had blown away the last little cloud, and now the sky was a vast expanse of deep blue out of which the sun shone and glittered on the green slopes. The little blue and yellow mountain flowers opened their cups and seemed to nod merrily at Heidi, who romped everywhere. Enchanted by this sparkling, waving sea of flowers, she forgot all about Peter and picked flowers until she had a big bunch which she wrapped in her pinafore, for she wanted to take them home. The pasture which Peter usually chose, and where he spent the day, was situated at the foot of the high rocks. Bushes and fir trees covered the lower parts, but near the summit the rocks rose bare and rugged towards the sky. On one side of the mountains, jagged clefts stretched far down, and the grandfather had been right to warn Peter of the danger. When they had reached the pasture, Peter carefully put his rucksack into a little hollow in the ground, and then stretched himself out at full length on the sunny pasture. Heidi, by this time, had undone her pinafore and rolled it neatly round the flowers, which she laid beside Peter's rucksack in the hollow. Then she sat down beside him and looked around. The valley lay far below, bathed in the sparkling morning sunshine. In front of Heidi, a big, broad snowfield rose up to the dark blue sky, and on the left stood a huge pile of rocks, above which a bare, rocky peak reached towards the sky, towering majestically above the child. Heidi sat motionless. She had never been so happy. The golden sunlight, the fresh breezes, and the delicate perfume of the flowers filled her with delight, and she only wished that she might stay there forever. So the day passed quickly, and the sun began to sink behind the mountains. Heidi was sitting quietly on the ground, gazing at the cistus and the harebells which glistened in the evening sunshine. Rocks and grass shimmered in a golden glow. Suddenly she jumped up and cried, Peter! Peter! They're all on fire! The, the mountains are burning! And, and the great snow mountain also! And the sky! Oh, look at the lovely fiery snow! Peter, look! It's always like that, replied Peter with great unconcern. But it's not really fire. What is it then? asked Heidi, gazing eagerly around. It just gets like that. Peter tried to explain. Oh, look, look, Peter, cried Heidi again in great excitement. Everything is turning a rosy pink colour. Oh, how beautiful. Crimson snow. Oh, now all the rocks are turning grey. Now the colour is all gone. Now it's all over, Peter. Heidi sat down, looking as distressed as if everything really had come to an end. Tomorrow it will be the same, said Peter. Get up now, we must go home. 
Will it be like this every day we are on the pasture? asked Heidi insistently as she walked down the elm at Peter's side. Mostly, he replied. Heidi was very happy. She had absorbed so many new impressions, had so many new things to think about that she was quite silent until they reached the hut and saw the grandfather sitting on the bench under the fir trees. Here he sat in the evenings, waiting for his goats. Heidi raced towards the old man. Oh, grandfather, it was wonderful, she cried long before she reached him. The fire on the snow and the rocks and the blue and the yellow flowers and look what I've brought for you. She unfolded her pinafore and all the flowers fell at the grandfather's feet. But what a sight the poor flowers were. Heidi did not recognize them. They were like withered grass and not a single little cup was open. Grandfather, what is the matter with the flowers? cried Heidi, quite alarmed. They weren't like that before. What is wrong with them? They would rather be out in the sun than tied up in a pinafore, explained the grandfather. Then I will never gather any more. You had better have your bath now, said the grandfather, and I shall fetch some milk from the shed. Afterwards, when we are having our supper, you can tell me about everything. Later, when Heidi sat on her chair, the little bowl of milk in front of her and the grandfather at her side, she told him everything, how wonderful it had all been, and particularly about the fire in the evening. Heidi wanted the grandfather to explain why this had happened, since Peter had been unable to do so. You see, the grandfather instructed her, that's what the sun does when he says good night to the mountains. He throws his most beautiful rays over them so that they won't forget him before morning. Heidi was delighted. She could hardly wait for the next day when she would again be allowed to go to the pasture to watch how the sun said good night to the mountains. But first, she had to go to bed. And how soundly she slept all night on her hay bed and dreamt of nothing but glistening mountains tinged with red, and little swan running happily about. Next morning the sun shone brightly as Peter appeared with the goats, and they all went up together to the pasture. And so it continued every day. Heidi grew stronger and sturdier with living so much in the open, and her little sunburnt face shone with health. When autumn came and the wind blew with greater force over the mountains, the grandfather would sometimes say, Today you'd better stay at home, Heidi. A little one like you might easily be swept down the mountainside by the wind. But when Peter heard this in the morning, he would look very miserable. He found it very dull now without Heidi. On such days, the goats would become so stubborn that he had twice as much trouble with them. They too had grown so accustomed to Heidi that they would hardly move off without her. As the season changed, the sun lost the fierce heat of summer, and Heidi looked out her warm stockings and shoes and her wool dress. Gradually the weather grew colder, and Peter would appear early in the morning, blowing on his hands to warm them. Then one morning they awoke to find the whole alm covered in snow. Not one blade of grass was visible. Peter and the goats did not appear, and Heidi watched from the window of the hut, as the big snowflakes fell. The snow fell thickly until it reached above the window so that it was impossible to open it, and Heidi and the Alm uncle were imprisoned in the hut. This amused Heidi, and she ran from one window to another, expecting the hut to be covered right over at any moment. The next day it had stopped snowing, and the grandfather forced his way out and shuffled the snow away from around the hut. Soon the snow was heaped up around the cottage, and they were able to open the window again. In the afternoon, as Heidi and the grandfather sat together by the fire, there came a great thumping outside the door. At last the door opened, and there stood Peter, knocking the snow from his boots. "'Good evening,' he said, coming in and at once getting as near as possible to the fire. "'Well, General, how are things going?' called the grandfather. 
Now that the goat army has been disbanded, you will have to turn to nibbling at the slate pencil. Why must he nibble at the slate pencil? asked Heidi. In winter, the boy has to go to school, explained the grandfather. There he learns to read and write, and that is sometimes difficult. And then it helps a little if one can nibble the slate pencil. Isn't that so, General? Yes, that's true, acknowledged Peter. Now Heidi's interest was thoroughly aroused. She asked Peter many questions about school and everything to be seen and heard there. The grandfather kept silent during this dialogue, but an occasional twitch of amusement at the corners of his mouth showed that he was listening. It began to grow dark, and Peter prepared to go home. He had already bade them good night, but turned again at the door and said, "I'll come back again on Sunday, a week today." But the grandmother said she would like you to come to see her sometime. This new idea of going to visit somebody appealed to Heidi at once, and on the following morning her first words were, "Grandfather, I must go down and see the grandmother." The snow is too deep today," replied the grandfather to put her off. But Heidi was determined to go, since she had got the grandmother's message. Not a day passed without her pleading, "Grandfather, I must go now. The grandmother is waiting for me." On the fourth day, a hard frost had set in, and the ground cracked at every step. The grandfather rose and, going up to the hayloft, brought down the thick sack. Which was Heidi's bed cover. Come then, he said. Joyously, the child skipped out into the glittering snow world. The old fir trees were silent now, and on every branch the snow lay thickly. The grandfather went into the shed, and brought out a large sleigh. There was a pole fixed at the side, and from the low seat the sleigh could be guided by the feet, pressing against the ground, and with the help of the pole. The grandfather took his seat on the sleigh and placed the child on his knee, wrapping her carefully in the sack to keep her warm. His arm held her secure, and this was necessary for the long drive ahead. Then he grasped the pole with his right hand and gave a push with his feet. The sleigh shot down the elm with such rapidity that Heidi felt she was flying through the air like a bird. She shouted aloud with joy. By and by, the sleigh stopped with a jerk just outside Goat Peter's cottage. The grandfather lifted the child and unwrapped her, saying, "Now in you go, and when it starts to get dark, come straight home." Then he turned the sleigh back up the mountain. Heidi opened the cottage door and found herself in a small, rather dark room. This cottage was quite different from her grandfather's, and everything looked. Very poor and shabby. She saw a table, and at the table a woman was sitting patching a jacket, which Heidi recognized at once as Peter's. In the corner, an old bent woman sat spinning. Heidi went straight to her. "Good day, grandmother," she said. "Here I am to see you." The old woman lifted her head and groped for the hand which Heidi held out to her. When she had found it, she held it for a while thoughtfully. Then she said, "Are you the child who stays with the Alm, Uncle? Are you Heidi?" "Yes," said Heidi. "I've just come down in the sleigh with Grandfather." "Who could believe it possible? I didn't think the child would stay up there more than three weeks." How does she look, Brigitte? Peter's mother had carefully inspected Heidi from every angle, so she was able to report, "She is as finely built as Adelheid was, but she has the dark eyes and curly hair of Tobias and the old man. I think she resembles both her parents." During this time, Heidi's attention had not been idle. She had looked round carefully at everything in the room. Suddenly, she said, "Look, grandmother, one of your shutters is loose. 
the grandfather would put a nail in it, and and then the shutters would be all right. It, it will break the window pane soon. See how it shakes. Ah, my child," said the grandmother. "I can't see, but I can hear, and much more than the shutter banging. Everything in this house creaks and rattles as soon as the wind blows. During the night, when the others are asleep." I often fear that the house is going to fall to pieces and kill us all. But can't you see the shutter banging, grandmother? Alas, child, I can see nothing," lamented the grandmother. "It will always be dark for me. But surely in summer it will be different, grandmother," comforted Heidi, becoming more and more anxious to help. "Surely then it will be light for you." When the sun shines on the mountains, and on the flowers, and turns them all to crimson. Come, my dear Heidi, come, and I will explain something to you. You see, when one can't see, one likes to hear a kind word, and I like to hear you talking. Come, sit here close to me, and tell me what you've been doing up there, and all about your grandfather. I knew him very well years ago. The grandmother was silent now, and Heidi began to give a lively account of her life, of summer days on the pasture, and her present life in winter with the grandfather. She described the things he could make from wood, benches and chairs and beautiful mangers where the hay was put for little swan and little bear, and a big new tub for bathing in summer, a new milk bowl and a spoon. Heidi was quite carried away describing all the beautiful things which could be made from pieces of wood. The grandmother listened intently, and every now and then she would say, "Do you hear, Brigitte? Do you hear what she says about the Alm, Uncle?" Suddenly, the story was interrupted by a loud clatter at the door, and in tramped Peter. "Is the boy back from school already?" asked the grandmother in surprise. An afternoon has not passed so quickly for me for a long time. Good evening, Peter. Heidi jumped up from the chair, stretched out her hand quickly to the grandmother, and said, "Goodbye, grandmother. I have to go home when it gets dark." She said good night to Peter and his mother and went towards the door. But the grandmother called anxiously, "Wait, wait, Heidi. You mustn't go alone. Peter will go with you." The children had only gone a little way up the mountain when they saw the grandfather coming down, and soon he stood beside them. "Good, Heidi, you have kept your word," he praised her. Then, wrapping her snugly in the cover, he picked her up and turned back up the mountain. As soon as they entered the hut and Heidi was released from her wrapping, she said, "Grandfather." Tomorrow we must take the hammer and plenty of long nails to fix the grandmother's shutters and all the loose boards because her house rattles and shakes all over. Must we indeed? And who told you so? Inquired the grandfather. Nobody told me, but I know myself. Replied Heidi. For everything is loose, and if the grandmother cannot sleep, she is afraid that any minute the house will fall down on their heads. And for her, everything is dark. Think how sad it is for her always having to sit in the dark and being frightened, and only you can help her. Tomorrow we will go and help her, won't we, grandfather? Heidi clung tightly to the grandfather and looked up at him with eagerness and confidence. For a little while, the old man looked down at the child. Then he said, "Yes, Heidi, we will go and see about the repairs. We can do that tomorrow." The grandfather kept his promise. And on the following afternoon, they took the same sleigh drive as they had done the previous day. Once again, the old man set the child down before the door of Goat Peter's cottage and said, "Go in now, and come away again, whenever it gets dark." Scarcely had Heidi opened the door and skipped into the room when Grandmother called from her corner, "It is Heidi! Here comes the child." Heidi ran to her at once. And drawing the little chair close to her, she sat down at her side. Once again, there was so much she had to tell the grandmother, and so many questions she had to ask. But suddenly, such heavy blows sounded against the wall that the grandmother started violently and nearly upset the spinning wheel. 
Mercy on us! She exclaimed, trembling. What is it? The house must be falling about us. Heidi grasped her arm firmly and comforted her. No, no, grandmother, don't be afraid. It's only grandfather hammering. He will fix everything so that you don't need to be afraid any more. Is it possible? Then the Lord has not forgotten us. The grandmother exclaimed. D "Did you hear that, Brigitte? If it is the Alm Uncle, go and tell him to come in so that I can thank him." Brigitte went outside. The Alm Uncle was busy nailing some strong planks to the wall, knocking in the nails with great vigor. Brigitte approached and said, "Good evening, Uncle. Mother and I want to thank you for your kindness, and she would like to tell you herself how grateful she is." That will do. Interrupted the old man. I know what you think of the alm uncle. Go back inside. I can find out for myself what is needed here. Brigitte obeyed at once, for the uncle expressed himself in a way which brooked no opposition. He knocked and hammered his way all round the house, and then climbed the narrow little stair up to the roof, and hammered away there until he had used his last nail. By the time he had finished. Darkness had fallen, and he had no sooner come down and got out the sleigh from behind the shed than Heidi appeared. As on the previous day, the grandfather wrapped her up and took her in his arms, and dragging the sleigh behind, made his way back up the mountain. And so the winter passed. After many lonely years, a great happiness had entered the joyless life of the old blind grandmother, and her days were no longer dreary and dark. For now she had something to look forward to. From early morning she listened for Heidi's familiar tripping steps. The child became very attached to the old grandmother, and without any fuss, the grandfather always packed in his tools and spent many afternoons repairing the cottage. All his good work soon had its effect, and the cottage no longer rattled and groaned when the wind blew around it. The grandmother said she had not slept so well for many a year. And that she would never forget what the Alm Uncle had done for her. Quickly the winter passed, and more quickly still the happy days of summer. And now another winter was drawing to its close. One sunny morning in March, as Heidi ran out of the house, she was startled to come face to face with an old gentleman dressed in black. He stood regarding her gravely for a time, and then, thinking that his unexpected appearance had frightened her. He said kindly, "It is all right. You need not be afraid of me. You are Heidi, are you not? Where is your grandfather? He is sitting at the table making wooden spoons," replied Heidi, and at once led him inside. It was the old pastor from Dorfley who had known the uncle well in the old days. He walked towards the old man who was bent over his work, and addressed him. "Good morning, neighbour." Astonished, the grandfather looked up, then rose, saying, "Good morning, pastor." Offering his seat to the visitor, he added, "Pray sit down." The pastor seated himself. "I have not seen you for a long time, neighbour," he said. "Nor are you." "I have come today to discuss something with you," continued the pastor. "I think perhaps you know what it is I want to talk to you about." There was a silence. The pastor glanced quickly towards the child who stood by the door and watched the newcomer with interest. "Heidi, go and see how the goats are getting along," said the grandfather. "You may take them a little salt and stay with them until I come." Heidi disappeared at once. "The child should have gone to school a year ago," said the pastor. The schoolmaster reminded you more than once, but you ignored him. What is it you intend should become of the child, neighbour? I intend that she should not go to school. The pastor looked with surprise at the old man who sat on his bench with his arms folded determinedly. But how is the child going to grow up? Asked the pastor reasonably. She will grow up with the goats and birds. That way she will learn nothing evil. 
But the child is neither a goat nor a bird, but a human being, pleaded the pastor. Though she learns nothing evil from her companions, they cannot teach her her ABC. The child must not be allowed to run about another winter without taking lessons. Next winter she must attend school regularly. You think so? said the old man, and the tremor in his voice betrayed that he was no longer calm. And you really think that next winter I shall send a delicate child on a two hours walk down the mountain on ice cold mornings in storm and snow, and allow her to return at night when there may be a wind raging fit to blow a man over, let alone a child? Perhaps the pastor still remembers the child's mother, Adelheid. She was a sleepwalker and had a delicate constitution. Might not the health of this child, who is also finely built, be endangered by so much exertion? You are quite right, neighbor, agreed the pastor amicably. It would not be possible to send the child from here, but I see the child is dear to you. For her sake, do what you ought to have done long ago. Come down into Dorfley and live amongst us. What a life you live here, alone and embittered towards God and men. If anything should happen to you up here in the mountains, who would come to your assistance? Living down in the valley is out of the question. The people down there despise me and I them. For all our sakes, it is better we stay apart. No, no, you are wrong, the pastor said warmly. The people down below don't dislike you half as much as you think. Take my advice, neighbor. Make your peace with God. Ask his forgiveness, and then come and see how people will change towards you and how happy you will be. The pastor rose. The almuncle shook hands with him, but insisted firmly. I know you mean well, but as to what you expect me to do, no. Once and for all, I tell you I will not send the child. Nor will I come down to live in the valley. Then God help you, sighed the pastor, and sadly made his way down the mountain. As a result of the interview, the almuncle was in a very black mood, and when Heidi asked in the afternoon, Shall we go down to the grandmother's now? he replied harshly, Not today. He was silent the whole day and the following morning. But before the dinner dishes had been cleared away, another visitor had arrived. It was Cousin Deetie, dressed in a beautiful gown which swept the floor and wearing on her head a fine hat with feathers. The almuncle examined her from head to foot in amazement, but Deetie was all prepared to make friendly conversation and at once adopted a flattering tone. How well the child looks! I hardly recognize her! I can see that she has not had a bad time with the almuncle, far from it. Day and night I have thought about what to do with her, and that's why I'm here today. I have just heard of something that would be a piece of luck for Heidi. I have fixed everything. It is a really wonderful chance. The people I am in service with have some very wealthy relations. They live in the most beautiful house in Frankfurt, and they have an only daughter who is an invalid who has to be wheeled in a chair. She is very much alone, and has her lessons with a private teacher, which of course is very boring for her. Now she would like a playmate, so her people have asked my mistress to help them find a companion. The lady housekeeper thinks that a simple, unspoiled child, one different from the children nowadays, would be most suitable. Naturally, I thought of Heidi, and went at once to the lady and told her all about our child's character. She agreed immediately to take her. No one can foresee what good fortune will be in store for Heidi. If the people become fond of her, and if something should happen to their own little daughter, and who knows when she is so weak, then in all likelihood they would not want to be without a child, then it would be the most unheard of luck. Do you think you have just about finished? interrupted the Elm uncle, who had held his peace up until now. Huh? exclaimed Deetie, tossing her head. You behave as though I were telling you something of no consequence. 
anybody would thank God if I were to bring such news. You may take your news where you like. I want to hear no more of it," replied the uncle dryly. This threw Deity immediately into a passion. "Well," she stormed, "if that is all you have to say, Uncle, I speak my mind too. The child is eight years old now, but she knows nothing. You neither want her to attend school or go to church. Oh, I have heard all about it in Dorfley. She is my sister's child, and I am responsible for what happens to her." When such a good chance comes her way, only one who cared nothing for her welfare would oppose it. But I tell you, I won't give in, and people are on my side. There is not a single person who would not take my part, and they are all against you. Hold your tongue! Thundered the uncle, his eyes ablaze with anger. Very well then, take your child away and ruin her, and never let me set eyes on you again with that. Ridiculous hat on your head, and such words on your tongue. Then the uncle turned from her abruptly and strode from the hut. You have made grandfather angry," said Heidi, fixing dark, smouldering eyes on her aunt. "Oh, he'll soon get over it," replied Deity impatiently. "Come along now. Where are your clothes?" "I won't go," said Heidi defiantly. "What did you say?" Asked the aunt, about to fly into a temper, then she softened her tone a little and continued more persuasively, "Come, come, don't be so silly. You are as obstinate as a goat. I suppose that is what you have learned from them. But you've got to understand, the grandfather is cross and doesn't want to see us again. You heard him say so. He wants you to go with me. So now you mustn't make him more angry." You have no idea how nice it is in Frankfurt, but of course, if you don't like it, you can always come back here. By that time, the grandfather will have recovered himself. Can I come straight home again if I want to? Asked Heidi. Come along now and don't be silly. I said you can go home when you like. Aunt Deety took the bundle of clothes under one arm, grasped Heidi firmly by the other hand, and together they started to climb down the hill. When they came to Goat Peter's cottage, Heidi wanted to say goodbye to the grandmother, but that was exactly what the aunt did not want. She tried to soothe the child. Come quickly now, or it will be too late, and we will not be able to continue our journey tomorrow. You will soon see how much you will like Frankfurt. Perhaps you will never want to come back again. But if you do, it will be quite simple. You could even take something home for the grandmother, something she would like. This appealed to Heidi, and she stopped trying to resist and started to run too. After a little while, she said, "What could I get for Grandmother? Something nice," said the aunt. "Perhaps some nice soft rolls. She would enjoy that. It would be such a change from the hard dark bread." "Oh yes, she always gives it to Peter and says it's too hard for me. I've heard her myself," admitted Heidi. "Let's hurry then, Aunt Deety." We may reach Frankfurt today, and I should be back with the rolls. And Heidi started to run so fast that the aunt, with her bundle, could hardly keep pace with her. In the house in Frankfurt, the little daughter of Herr Sesemann sat in the comfortable invalid chair, in which all her life was spent, and in which she had to be wheeled from room to room. Now she was in the room which they called the study, and where she had her lessons. Clara's little face was pale and thin, and her soft, gentle blue eyes were fixed at this moment on the door. Today, time seemed to pass very slowly for her, for she was saying rather impatiently, "But isn't it time yet, Fräulein Rotenmeier?" The lady thus addressed sat very upright at a small work table and nodded, principally because of her rather odd and very severe style of dress. Fräulein Rotenmeier presented an awe-inspiring appearance. Over her shoulders, she wore a cape with a stiff collar, and on her head a very elaborate cap. Since the death of Frau Sesemann several years ago, Fräulein Rotenmeier had acted as a housekeeper and manager of the domestic staff. Herr Sesemann very often went off on business trips, leaving Fräulein Rotenmeier in sole charge of the house. 
Just as Clara was asking the same question a second time, Dee and Heidi arrived at the door. Dee rang the bell, and the butler came down the stairs, the big round buttons of his livery in keeping with his round eyes, which stared blankly at the two strangers. "'I wonder if it's too late to see Fräulein Rottenmeier,' Dee asked. Sebastian stared frostily for a moment, then pressed a bell and disappeared without a word. Next, a maid appeared. A spotless white cap was perched on top of her head. "'Come this way. You are expected.' Dee and Heidi went upstairs and followed Tinette into the study. Fräulein Rottenmeier rose slowly and came forward to examine the new playmate for the daughter of the house. She did not appear to be very pleased with what she saw. Heidi wore her simple little cotton dress and on her head her old crushed straw hat. She gazed innocently from underneath it, staring with unconcealed surprise at the lady's towering headgear. "'What is your name?' asked Fräulein Rottenmeier, after a lengthy inspection of the child, who had returned her gaze steadily. "'Heidi,' the child answered distinctly. "'What? That is not a Christian name. You were surely not baptized so. What name were you given when you were christened?' "'I can't remember now,' replied Heidi. "'What a foolish answer!' exclaimed the lady, shaking her head disapprovingly. "'Diti, is the child stupid or impertinent?' "'I am sorry. Would you kindly allow me to speak for the child? She is not accustomed to strangers,' said Diti hastily, secretly nudging Heidi for having given such an unsuitable answer. "'She is certainly not stupid, nor impertinent.' It is just that she always says exactly what she's thinking. This is the first time she has ever been in such a fine house, and, and she knows nothing about good manners. She is docile and willing to learn if Madame will have the patience. She was christened Adelheid for her mother, my late sister. Well, that's a name one can pronounce, remarked Fräulein Rotenmeier. Now tell me, Adelheid. "'Which books did you use for your lessons?' "'None,' replied Heidi. "'What? How did you learn to read?' "'I never learnt," said Heidi. "'You cannot read. "'Is this true you cannot read?' demanded Fräulein Rottenmeier, deeply shocked. "'What did you learn, then?' "'Nothing,' said Heidi. "'Dee cried Fräulein Rottenmeier, when she had recovered from this shock. This is not the agreement at all. How dare you bring this child to me? But Diti was not easily frightened and replied boldly, With Madame's permission, the child is just what I understood Madame wanted. Madame told me she wanted a companion, unlike ordinary children. Therefore, I chose this one. But now I'm afraid I must go. My mistress will be expecting me. With a curtsy, Diti left the room and quickly ran downstairs. For a moment, Fräulein Rotenmeier was too surprised to speak. Then she ran after Diti. Heidi still stood by the door. So far, Clara had watched silently. Now she beckoned to Heidi to come nearer. "'Would you rather be called Heidi or Adelheid?' asked Clara. "'I'm always called Heidi,' Heidi replied. "'Then I shall always call you that, too,' said Clara. "'Did you come to Frankfurt yesterday?' "'No, today. But tomorrow I'm going home again with some white rolls for the grandmother.' "'How strange you are!' Clara burst out. "'You have been brought here to stay with me and share my lessons with me. "'What fun it will be now because you can't read at all. "'At least it will be a change.' You see, every morning at ten my tutor comes and the lessons go on till two. But it will be much more fun now. I can listen to you learning to read. Just then, Fräulein Rottenmeier came back into the room. She had not succeeded in calling Dieti back and was apparently very annoyed about it. Sebastian opened the folding doors of the study and quietly wheeled Clara into the dining room. He helped Clara to her seat at the table 
and Fräulein Rotenmeier seated herself beside her, motioning Heidi to sit opposite. Beside Heidi's plate lay a lovely white roll. She glanced at it happily, but she sat as quiet as a mouse until Sebastian came to her side to serve fish. Then she pointed to the roll and asked, May I have it? Sebastian nodded, glancing sideways at Fräulein Rotenmeier to see what effect the question had had on her. Immediately Heidi took the roll and put it into her pocket. At this breach of etiquette, Sebastian was almost in danger of losing control of his features, and the arm which held the dish was beginning to shake. "'You can leave the dish on the table and come back afterwards,' ordered Fräulein Rottenmeier, looking very severe, and Sebastian disappeared at once. "'Adelheid, I see I shall have to teach you the first simple rules of good behaviour," said the lady with a deep sigh. First of all, I will show you how to behave at table. She instructed Heidi thoroughly and clearly on what she had to do. Then followed a long list of rules about getting up and going to bed, about entering and leaving a room, about being tidy and shutting doors. After dinner, Heidi was shown to her bedroom, which was at the end of a long passage, beyond those of Clara and Fräulein Rottenmeier. She was very tired for she had had a long journey, and she was soon asleep. Heidi awoke in the morning and looked around in bewilderment. She blinked and rubbed her eyes. Suddenly she remembered that she was in Frankfurt, and the events of the previous day came back to her quite clearly. She jumped out of bed and dressed, then went from one window to the other, trying to get a glimpse of the sky and the countryside outside. But the view was not one of pleasant green fields, but one of walls and windows. At breakfast, Clara greeted Heidi in a friendly way. Her face wore a much happier expression than usual, for she was looking forward to all kinds of unexpected events that day. Breakfast passed without incident. Heidi ate her rolls very nicely, and when they were finished, Clara was wheeled back to the study. As soon as the children were alone together, Clara began to ask Heidi about her home, and Heidi was delighted to tell her all about the alm and the goats and the pasture and everything that was dear to her. Clara always rested in the afternoons, so Heidi was told she might do as she pleased. This suited her perfectly, because there was something she very much wanted to do. But she needed assistance, and for this reason she posted herself in front of the dining room door, right in the centre of the hall, so that she would not miss the person to whom she wished to speak. It was not very long before Sebastian came upstairs, carrying a large tray. "'Is there something the little Fräulein wants?' inquired Sebastian, carrying the silver into the dining-room. "'I can only see the stony street from these windows,' said Heidi. "'Where must I go to see the whole valley?' "'You must climb a high tower or a church steeple. From there you can see ever so far.' At that, Heidi quickly raced downstairs into the street. But it was not so easy as she had imagined. She walked on and on. Many people passed, but they all seemed to be in such a hurry that Heidi did not like to stop any of them to ask the way. Then she saw a boy standing on the street corner with a barrel organ, and, perched on his arm, a very strange-looking little animal. Heidi went forward and asked, do you know of any church with a high steeple? Yes, I know one. Well, then, come and show it to me. You show me first what you will give me for it, said the boy, holding his hand out. What do you want? asked Heidi. Money, said the boy. I haven't got any now, but Clara will give me some later. How much do you want? Tuppence. Well, come along, then. Heidi asked her companion what he was carrying on his back. He told her it was a barrel organ, which played beautiful music when you turned the handle. All at once they found themselves in front of an old church with a high steeple. The boy stood still and pointed at it. Heidi had discovered a bell in the wall, which she now pulled as hard as she could. When I go up, you must wait here for me, for I don't know my way back, and you must show it to me. What will I get for it? What do you want? I must have another tuppence, the boy demanded. 
they heard steps inside and the door creaked open. An old man appeared, looking first surprised and then angry when he saw the children. Please, sir, said Heidi, I would just like to go up to the top of the tower and look down on the whole valley. The imploring look in Heidi's eyes made the old man change his manner. He took her hand and said kindly, Well, if you really want it so much, I will take you up. The boy sat down on the stone steps and prepared to wait. Together, Heidi and the old man climbed many, many steps, which became smaller and smaller as they went up, until at last a very narrow little stair led up to the top of the tower. The caretaker lifted Heidi up to let her see out of the window. Now you can look down, he said. Heidi saw nothing but roofs, steeples, and chimneys. She withdrew her head presently and said, It is not at all as I expected. There. You see how little ones like you knows nothing about views? Now come down and never ring my bell again. The old man put Heidi back on the floor and went ahead of her down the narrow stair. When the steps got broader, they came to the caretaker's little room, and beside it, underneath the sloping roof, stood a big basket. In front of it sat a big grey cat, and inside the basket were a number of meowing little kittens. Heidi went over to the basket and exclaimed joyfully, Oh, what sweet kittens! Would you like one? asked the old man as he watched Heidi with amusement. Heidi was overjoyed. <laughs> there was certainly plenty of room in the big house, and how happy the kittens would make Clara. If only I could take one or two with me now, one for me and, and one for Clara. May I? Yes, take them. Heidi's eyes shone with delight. She chose a white one and a tabby and put one into her right and one into her left pocket. Then they went downstairs. The boy was still sitting on the steps outside. He jumped up when he saw Heidi, and in a short time they reached Herr Sesemann's house. Heidi rang the bell and Sebastian opened the door. When he saw Heidi, he hustled her inside. Quickly, into the dining room. They're all at table, and Fräulein Rottenmeier looks like a loaded cannon. But why did you run away like that? Heidi went into the room. Fräulein Rottenmeier did not look up. Clara said nothing, and it was an altogether uneasy atmosphere. When Heidi was seated, Fräulein Rotemeyer began in a very severe and solemn voice. Adelheid, I shall talk to you afterwards. I will only say now that you have behaved very badly, leaving the house without permission. Your conduct is unparalleled. Meow! It sounded like an answer. Now the lady's temper rose. What? You are rude as well as naughty? I didn't, began Heidi. Meow! Meow! Sebastian could conceal his amusement no longer and had to leave the room. That will do, Fräulein Rottenmeier tried to say, but her voice cracked with excitement. Get up and leave the room. Frightened, Heidi got up and tried to explain. I, I really didn't. Meow! Meow! It's the kittens. What? Cats! screamed Fräulein Rottenmeier. Sebastian! Tinette! Find the horrid animals! Remove them at once! She rushed into the study and locked the door, for she disliked cats more than anything. Sebastian had to wait outside the door until his face was straight again. When he had served Heidi, he had noticed the little kitten's head peeping out of her pocket. When at last he entered the room, everything seemed quiet and peaceful again. Clara had the kittens on her lap, and Heidi knelt beside her. Both played happily with the two tiny animals. Sebastian, said Clara, you must help us to find a place for the kittens where Fräulein Rottenmeier will not find them. I shall see to that, Fräulein Clara, replied Sebastian willingly. I shall prepare a nice bed in a basket and put it in a place where Madam is not likely to go. Rely on me. The lecture for Heidi was put off until the following day, as Fräulein Rottenmeier felt too exhausted and retired quietly. Clara and Heidi went cheerfully to bed, 
knowing that the kittens were all right. The following morning, shortly after Sebastian had admitted the tutor, the doorbell rang again, so loudly this time that the butler thought the master himself had arrived home unexpectedly. He rushed downstairs and threw open the door, and there stood a little ragged boy with a barrel organ on his shoulder. "'What do you want?' asked Sebastian irritably. "'I'll teach you to ring the bell like that. Be off with you.' "'I want to see Clara,' the urchin replied. "'You cheeky brat! Don't you know how to say Fräulein Clara?' "'What could you possibly have to see Fräulein Clara about?' stormed Sebastian. "'She owes me fourpence,' said the boy. "'You must be insane. What makes you think Fräulein Clara lives here anyway?' "'Yesterday I showed her the way for tuppence, and back again. That was fourpence. "'She has short, curly hair and talks different from us.' "'Oh,' thought Sebastian, "'so this is more mischief the little Fräulein has been up to.' "'He chuckled to himself, as an idea occurred to him, and then said aloud, "'Very well. Come with me. But wait outside the door until I call you. "'When I let you into the room,' "'Begin right away to play a tune on your barrel-organ for the young lady. "'That will please her.' "'Sebastian knocked on the study door and went in. "'There is a boy outside who says he has a message for Fräulein Clara,' he announced. "'This unexpected interruption to the lesson delighted Clara. "'Let him in at once,' she begged, turning to her tutor. "'The boy entered.' and at once started to play his organ according to Sebastian's instructions. Fräulein Rotenmeier was busy in the dining-room when the sound came to her ears. Was it in the street? Yet it seemed so much nearer. But who could be playing an organ in the study? And yet... She rushed into the study, and there, incredible as it seemed, there stood the ragged organ-player. Clara and Heidi were listening happily. Stop! Stop at once, commanded Fräulein Rottenmeier, but her voice was drowned by the music. She was walking towards the boy when suddenly on the floor between her feet she caught sight of a horrible, dark, crawling animal. At the sight of it, Fräulein Rottenmeier leaped into the air, shrieking at the top of her voice, Sebastian! Sebastian! The organ player stopped abruptly. Sebastian stood behind the door, convulsed with laughter. At last he came in. Take them away, all of them, boy, animal and all, at once, Sebastian. Sebastian dragged off the boy with the tortoise, at the same time putting something into his hand and whispering, Fourpence for Fräulein Clara, and fourpence for the music. You have done well. In the evening, Fräulein Rottenmeier held an inquiry into the affair. She summoned Sebastian and Tinette, and it soon became evident that Heidi, on her excursion of the previous day, had been responsible for all these alarming occurrences. Fräulein Rottenmeier was pale with anger. She gave a sign for Sebastian and Tinette to withdraw. Then she turned to Heidi, who stood beside Clara's chair, not very sure of what dreadful crime she had been guilty. Adelheid! Fräulein Rottenmeier began in a stern voice. Herr Sessemann is coming home soon, and when he does, I will tell him everything about this frightful misconduct, for you are nothing but a little barbarian. Although a few days passed quietly after this, Fräulein Rottenmeier failed to regain her peace of mind. She was constantly aware of the disappointment that Heidi had been, and of the fact that since her arrival, the whole household had been upset. But Clara was very happy indeed. She was never bored now, for during lessons something amusing was always happening. Instead of trying to learn the letters, Heidi would cry out, Oh, it's shaped like a goat's horn! Or, It's like an eagle! Until the poor tutor would completely lose patience. Then, after lessons were over, in the late afternoon, Heidi would sit with Clara and tell her about the alm and how much she wanted to go back. Indeed, she would talk to her about her old home until the longing to go back became very great. One day, the memory of the snow-capped peaks and the green valley made her feel so homesick 
that she hastily put on her little straw hat and started off for home. But she got no further than the front door, for there stood Fräulein Rotenmeier, just returned from her walk. Her sharp eyes looked Heidi up and down. What is the meaning of this? Didn't I forbid you to run about in the streets? I wasn't going to run about. I just wanted to go home, explained Heidi, frightened. Wanted to go home, indeed? I wonder what Herr Sesemann would have to say to this. Running away from this beautiful house? What do you find wrong with it, I should like to know? Have you ever in your life had such a splendid place to live in, or, or had so many servants to wait upon you, have you? No, said Heidi. I should think not, continued the lady. You are an exceedingly ungrateful child who thinks of nothing but getting into mischief. This rebuke was too much for Heidi, and she began to pour out all the things that she had kept hidden for so long. I only want to go home because little Swan will be crying and the grandmother is waiting for me. Here, I can never watch the sun saying good night to the mountains. Mercy, the child has gone out of her mind, cried Fräulein Rotenmeier, rushing upstairs and colliding with Sebastian. Take the unfortunate creature upstairs at once, she called to him. Heidi looked such a picture of dejection as she slowly climbed the stairs that Sebastian felt really sorry for her. "'Don't you give in,' he said encouragingly. "'There's a brave little girl. Never a tear all the time she's with us. And others at her age cry twelve times a day. And the kittens are so happy. You should just see them jumping about in the loft. Afterwards we shall go up and look at them together, shall we? When Madam is not here?' Heidi nodded, but not very cheerfully, and disappeared into her room. A few days later, there was great excitement in the house because Herr Sesemann had returned. Sebastian and Tinette were kept busy carrying up parcels and suitcases from the carriage. They were packed with all sorts of exciting presents which Clara's father was in the habit of bringing back from his travels. It was late afternoon when Herr Sesemann arrived, and he came straight into the study where Clara and Heidi were sitting together. Father and daughter greeted each other affectionately. Then Herr Sesemann held out his hand to Heidi and said kindly, And this is our little Swiss girl. Come and shake hands with me. That's right. And now, Clara, you must allow me to go and have something to eat. I have had nothing since breakfast. Later I shall see you again and show you all the things I have brought home. In the dining room, Herr Sesemann sat down, and the Fräulein Rottenmeier, looking the picture of gloom, took the place opposite. "'What is the matter, Fräulein Rottenmeier?' asked Herr Sesemann. "'You look very dismal. Clara seems to be cheerful enough. What is wrong?' With a long face the lady began. "'Herr Sesemann, we have been completely deceived with that child. Completely taken in. Really shocking.' But what is so shocking? I see nothing shocking in the child, remarked Herr Sesemann, still completely unperturbed. Oh, if you only knew the type of people and the animals this creature has brought into your house. Herr Sesemann, it is beyond my understanding. Her whole behavior would be beyond comprehension were it not for one thing. She has spells of mental disturbance, concluded Fräulein Rottenmeier with conviction. Up till now, Herr Sesemann had not thought the affair of any great importance, but mental disturbance, that could very easily have a harmful effect on his little daughter. He looked quickly at Fräulein Rottenmeier, as though to assure himself that it was not she who was the victim of a troubled mind. "'You must please excuse me now. I must speak to my daughter.' And with these words, Herr Sesemann quickly left the room. In the study he sat down beside his little girl, and turning to Heidi said, "'Listen, little one, will you go and fetch me, uh, fetch me—' Herr Sesemann wanted the child out of the room, but was having difficulty in thinking up an excuse. Um, "'Fetch me a glass of water.' Heidi disappeared at once. "'And now, my dear Clara,' said Herr Sesemann, pulling his chair closer and taking his daughter's hand, "'tell me quite frankly—' 
What makes Fräulein Rottenmeier think your little friend is sometimes not quite right in her mind? Clara had no difficulty in explaining. She told her father the story of the tortoise and the kittens, and explained all the remarks which Fräulein Rottenmeier had thought so odd, and which seemed to upset her so much. Herr Sessamon laughed heartily. Well, then, you don't want me to send Heidi home, Clara. You are not tired of her? asked her father. No, no, papa, please don't, exclaimed Clara in alarm. The time has passed so quickly since Heidi came. Something happens every day, and it used to be so dull, and she always has so much to tell me. Very well, then. That very evening he told Fräulein Rottenmeier that Heidi would remain, that he found the child perfectly normal, and that his daughter preferred her company to any other. And, by the way, if you find difficulty in managing the child, there is a prospect that you will be relieved of this duty. I am expecting my mother very soon for a long visit, and, as you know, she gets along with everybody, Fräulein Rottenmeier, he concluded pointedly. Yes, I know, Herr Sessamon, said Fräulein Rottenmeier, rather sourly. Herr Sessamon remained only a short time at home, and after a fortnight he set off for Paris, comforting his little daughter with the prospect of the arrival of her grandmother in a day or two. The evening after Herr Sessamon's departure for Paris, great preparations were afoot in the Sessamon house, and presently there was the sound of a carriage stopping at the front door. Sebastian and Tinette rushed downstairs, and Fräulein Rottenmeier followed to welcome Frau Sessamon. Heidi approached and said very distinctly in her clear voice, "'Good evening, madam.' The grandmother smiled and patted Heidi's cheek. <laughs> "'When I am with children, I am always grandmamma. Can you remember that?' "'Yes, very well,' Heidi assured her. The grandmother looked more closely at Heidi, and Heidi's steady, serious eyes looked back at her eagerly, for there was a warmth about the old woman which attracted the child. And what is your name, child? It is really Heidi, but if you call me Adelheid, I shall try to remember. Frau Sessamon will agree that I had to choose a name which one could pronounce, and, of course, on account of the servants. Very correct, I have no doubt, Rottenmeier replied Frau Sessamon, but if the child is called Heidi, and is accustomed to that name, I shall call her by it. So that's settled. Fräulein Rottenmeier found it very embarrassing to be called by her surname, but since the grandmother would have her own way, there was nothing she could do about it. She was a very alert old lady, and had her wits about her, and she very soon knew exactly what was going on in the house. From the day Heidi had tried to go home, and Fräulein Rottenmeier had scolded her for being so wicked and ungrateful, a change had come over the child. She knew now that she could not go home whenever she liked, as Aunt Ditty had told her, but that she had to stay in Frankfurt for a long time, maybe forever. She also understood that Herr Sessamon would think her very ungrateful, and Clara and the grandmother too, if she again showed signs of wanting to leave. So there was no one to whom she could reveal how homesick she was, for she could not face giving the grandmother, who was so kind to her, cause to be angry as Fräulein Rottenmeier had been. But the strain of keeping all this to herself became almost more than she could bear. She lost her appetite, and every day grew paler and paler. At night she would lie awake for a long time, for as soon as she was alone, with everything quiet around her, she would see again in her thoughts the alm and the sunshine and the flowers, and when at last she fell asleep, she would see in her dreams the red summits of the crags and the crimson snowfield in the evening sun. Awaking in the morning, she wanted to run out happily into the sun, but she soon realized that she was in the big bed at Frankfurt, far, far away from home. Then Heidi would weep, long and quietly her head pressed into the pillow so that no one could hear. Heidi's unhappiness did not escape the grandmother. She waited a few days to see if there might be a change, but as Heidi remained subdued, and when she noticed that often in the early morning the child looked as though she had been crying, 
the grandmother took her one day into her room and said lovingly, Now, tell me, Heidi, what is the matter? Are you worrying about something? But not for the world would Heidi show ingratitude to the grandmother who had been so kind. So she replied, Please, I cannot tell you. Could you tell Clara, then? Oh, no, nobody, said Heidi, looking so pitiful that the grandmother was filled with compassion. Come here, little one, and I will tell you something. If one is in trouble and can't speak about it to anyone, then one tells it to God, who is in heaven, and prays to him for help, because he is able to take away all our troubles. Do you know that? It is no use. God does not listen, and I can understand it. When there are so many people in Frankfurt praying to him, he cannot possibly listen to them all. He certainly has not heard me. What makes you so sure, Heidi? I have prayed the same thing every day for weeks and weeks, and, and God has never done it. Oh, Heidi, that is not the way in which to think of him. You see, God is our heavenly Father and always knows what is best for us, even when we ourselves do not. If we ask for something which is not good for us, he does not grant it, but instead gives us the thing that is best for us. If we go on praying earnestly and never run away or lose faith, our prayers will be answered. Every word the grandmother said touched the child's heart, and she said repentantly, At once I will ask God to forgive me for running away, and I will never forget him again. That is a good child. He will help you at the right moment, never fear. Every afternoon during her visit, the grandmother sat beside Clara for a time while she was resting, and afterwards she would call Heidi into her room, and would talk to her and keep her occupied in all sorts of ways. The grandmother had pretty little dolls, and showed Heidi how to make little dresses and coats for them, so that without knowing it, Heidi had learned to sew. Since Heidi could now read, she would read aloud to the grandmother, and this she enjoyed very much, growing more fond of the stories the more she read them. It was a sad time for Clara and Heidi when the day of the grandmother's departure arrived, but the old lady insisted on making it quite a party, so that they would not think too much about her going. After the grandmother had driven off in her carriage, the house seemed very empty and silent, and Clara and Heidi felt quite lost. The days went by, and Heidi could hardly tell whether it were winter or summer, for all she ever saw of the outside world was the same grey walls and roofs. She was only allowed out when Clara was well enough to go for a short drive, which never took them farther than the neighbouring streets, and never had a glimpse of grass or flowers, let alone fir trees and mountains. Heidi's longing for the beautiful remembered things grew every day, so that she could not speak or think of them without her eyes filling with tears. Autumn and winter passed, and the spring sun shone on the white walls of the house opposite and Heidi knew it would soon be the time when Peter climbed up the alm with his goats. The flowers glittered in the sunshine, and in the evening mountains turned to crimson in the setting sun. Heidi would sit in her lonely little room and press her palms into her eyes so that she would not be able to see the sunshine striking the wall. And so she sat, silently struggling against homesickness, until she heard Clara's voice calling her, for some time, very strange things had been happening in the house. Every morning when the servants came down, they found the front door wide open. During the first few days when this had happened, all the rooms in the house were carefully searched for signs of burglary, but nothing was missing. At night, every care was taken, the door was carefully locked and bolted, and to make it even more secure, the wooden bar was put across. But all these precautions were of no avail. In the morning, the servants would again find the door wide open. Fräulein Rottenmeier wrote a long letter to Herr Sessemann, 
telling him he would have to return at once, as everyone in the house now went in fear of his life, and that she would not answer for the serious consequences the mysterious occurrence might have on his daughter's delicate constitution. This had the desired effect. Two days later, Herr Sesemann came home. And how is the ghost behaving? he asked Fräulein Rottenmeier with a twinkle in his eye. It is no joke, she replied tartly. I am sure by tomorrow Herr Sesemann will no longer consider it a laughing matter. Well, we shall see, replied Herr Sesemann. Now, Sebastian, go at once to my old friend Dr. Klassen. Give him my regards and ask him to come here tonight at nine o'clock. Tell him I have come specially from Paris to consult him. And will he make his arrangements to spend the night here? Do you understand? Promptly at nine o'clock, the doctor arrived. A grey-haired man with bright, kindly eyes. At first, he looked a little worried, but presently he burst out laughing. Well, well, for a patient with whom I am to sit up all night, you don't look too bad. Not so hasty, my friend. Wait until I tell you this. There is a ghost in the house. The doctor laughed uproariously. When he had heard the whole story, the two gentlemen went downstairs to the room off the hall. There they settled themselves comfortably in armchairs and smoked and chatted together with such enjoyment that, in what seemed no time at all, they heard the clock strike twelve. The ghost seems to have got wind of us and does not choose to come tonight, said the doctor. They resumed their conversation and until one o'clock struck, there was not a sound to be heard. Then suddenly the doctor lifted a finger. Shh! Sesemann, don't you hear something? They both listened, and heard distinctly the bar on the door being softly pushed aside, the key turning in the lock, and the door opening. Herr Sesemann seized one of the pistols which lay ready on the table. You're not afraid, are you? whispered the doctor. As well to be careful, Herr Sesemann replied, picking up the lamp. The doctor took the other pistol, and together they stepped out into the hall. Moonlight streamed through the open door, and fell on a white figure which stood motionless on the threshold. As both gentlemen advanced towards the little figure, it turned and gave a little cry. In her little white nightgown, and with her bare feet, Heidi stood there trembling and blinking at the light, and the weapons pointed in her direction. The two gentlemen turned and exchanged surprised glances. Child, what does this mean? asked Herr Sesemann. Why have you come downstairs? Pale and trembling, Heidi stood before him. I don't know, she whispered. Then the doctor intervened. Sesemann, this is something I shall have to deal with. Go and sit by the fire while I take the child up to bed. The doctor put down his revolver, and taking the child in his arms, he carried her upstairs, and laying her on the bed, he covered her carefully with the quilt. Then he sat on the edge of the bed, and taking her hand, he said kindly, Everything is all right now. Tell me, were you dreaming about something? Yes, I dream every night, and it is always the same. I think I'm with Grandfather, and outside I hear the fir trees rustling, and, and I think how beautifully the stars will be shining, and I run quickly and open the door of the cottage. But when I awake, I'm still in Frankfurt. Heidi struggled to swallow the lump which rose in her throat. I see, said the doctor. And then you have a good cry. Oh, no, I mustn't. Fräulein Rotenmeier doesn't allow it. Then you must swallow hard, is that it? But you like being in Frankfurt, don't you? Yes, said Heidi in a flat voice, which made it sound more like no. And where did you live when you were with your grandfather? Always on the Alm. And wasn't that rather dull for you on the Alm, Heidi? Oh, no, it was beautiful, it was so beautiful. Heidi could not go on. Remembrance of the past, the recent excitement, and the long-suppressed weeping overwhelmed the child. Tears gushed from her eyes, and her little body was shaken with sobs. 
the doctor rose. Gently he laid Heidi's head on the pillow. Cry a little. It will do no harm. And then sleep. Tomorrow everything will be all right. The doctor went downstairs and joined his friend. He lowered himself into the opposite armchair and looked across at him gravely. Sessamon, your little protégé is a sleepwalker. Every night, without knowing it, she has been opening the front door and alarming your staff. The child is pining away with homesickness. Didn't you see how pathetically thin she is? Now there is only one remedy, and that is to send her back home at once. My advice is that the child travel home tomorrow. Herr Sessamon got up in a great state of agitation and strode up and down the room. Ill? Homesick? Wasting away in my house? And nobody seems to have noticed it. And you, doctor, suggesting that I should send her back home in that pathetic state. No, 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 doctor, I cannot do it. You take the child in hand and restore her to health. Then I shall send her home if she wants to go. Sessamon, said the doctor, consider, this is not an illness that can be cured with pills and powders. The child does not have a strong constitution, but if she gets back home to the mountain air, she will very quickly recover. If not, wouldn't you rather send the child back ill than not at all? Such blunt words alarmed Herr Sessamon, and he agreed at once. Well, if you think that is the only way, then we must act at once. They discussed the matter further, and after a while the doctor took his leave. When the master of the house opened the door, the bright morning light shone in. He went to Clara's room, and, sitting beside her, he told her all that had happened, and about the doctor's verdict, and how they had decided to send Heidi home again at once. Clara was distressed, and made all sorts of suggestions for keeping Heidi with her. But her father remained firm, promising that if she were a good girl and did not make a fuss, she could go to Switzerland the following year. Heidi was completely ignorant of what was afoot until she entered the dining room for breakfast. Sessamon looked into her sad little face. Now, what do you say to this, little one? he asked kindly. Heidi looked at him in surprise. You are going home today? Home, repeated Heidi, faintly, turning pale. For a moment she could hardly breathe. She was so overcome by the news. Perhaps you don't want to go, suggested Herr Sessamon, smiling. Oh, yes, I, I do want to go home, she replied, her face aglow with pleasure. Very well, then. You must take a good breakfast, and then off you go on the train with Sebastian. But hard as she tried, Heidi could hardly swallow a mouthful for excitement. It all seemed like a dream. After breakfast, she rose eagerly and ran upstairs to Clara's room. In the middle of the floor stood a big trunk, which Clara had packed with dresses, pinafores, handkerchiefs, and all sorts of clothes. "'Look what I've packed for you,' said Clara. "'Aren't you pleased, Heidi? And look, Heidi!' Triumphantly, she held up a basket. Heidi peeped in and jumped for joy, for inside were beautiful white rolls for the grandmother. The children were so happily absorbed in their preparations that they had forgotten completely that the time for parting had come, and when the carriage was ready, there was no time left for sadness. Herr Sessamon shook hands with Heidi, wished her a happy journey, and said that he and Clara would always remember her. Heidi thanked him for all his kindness, and said finally, and please say goodbye to the doctor for me, and thank him very, very much. She had not forgotten his words of the night before when he had said, and tomorrow everything will be all right. And now these words had really come true, and Heidi was convinced that it was all his doing. She was lifted into the carriage, and trunk, basket, and provisions followed. Once more Herr Sessamon wished her a good journey, and the carriage rolled away. For two days Sebastian and Heidi travelled by train, until, when she least expected it, a voice shouted, Meienfeld! Up she jumped from her seat, and Sebastian followed. He engaged a man to take Heidi and her trunk as far as Dorfli, and from there 
somebody would take her up to the elm. I can go by myself. I know the way from Dorfley to the elm, said Heidi, who had been listening attentively to the conversation. Sebastian was greatly relieved not to have to do any climbing. He took Heidi aside and gave her a little leather bag and the letter to the grandfather, explaining, This little bag is a present from Herr Sesemann. It must go to the bottom of the basket under the rolls, and you must be very careful with it, for Herr Sesemann would be very angry if you were to lose it. I won't lose it, said Heidi confidently, and at once put both the bag and the letter at the bottom of her basket. The man with the cart was the baker from Dorfley, who was taking home his sacks of flour. "'Aren't you the little girl who lived with the uncle on the arm?' he shouted to Heidi, above the noise of the cart. "'Yes, I am,' replied Heidi. "'I've been living in Frankfurt.' "'Didn't they treat you well there?' "'No, it wasn't that. Nobody could have been treated better than I was in Frankfurt.' "'What brings you back, then? Wouldn't you rather have stayed?' Oh, I'd rather be with the grandfather on the Alm than anywhere else in the world. Maybe you'll think differently once you're there, muttered the baker. Then he started to whistle and said no more. Heidi looked round and trembled with excitement as she began to recognize the trees on the road and above the great towering peaks which seemed to welcome her back like old friends. As they drove into Dorfley, the clock was striking five. A group of women and children clustered round the cart and wanted to know where they had come from and where they were going. As the baker lifted Heidi down, she said quickly, Thank you. Grandfather will fetch the trunk later. Then she ran off. The baker quickly enlightened the women, declaring that although she had had the chance to live in a house where she had everything, it was her own wish to return to the grandfather. This news amazed everybody, and it was soon spread around Dorfley that Heidi had given up a luxurious home to return to the hut on the Alm. As fast as she could, Heidi climbed up from Dorfley. As she reached the top, the path got steeper and the basket seemed to get heavier and heavier, so that she was obliged to pause now and then to get her breath. There was only one thought in her mind. Would she find the grandmother still in her usual corner by the spinning wheel? Suddenly she caught sight of the cottage, and her heart began to pound. She ran as fast as she could until she reached the door and trembled so much with excitement that she could hardly open it. But at last she was inside, and standing in the middle of the little room with no breath left to say a word. "'Grandmother, I'm back!' called Heidi, and rushed towards the old woman. She put her arms around her and hugged her, unable to speak for joy. At first the grandmother was too surprised to utter a word. Then she caressed Heidi's curly head and said, Yes, it is her hair and her voice. Thank God that he has granted this to me. Tears of joy spilled from her blind eyes. Don't cry. I'm really back and will come to you every day and never go away again. And you won't have to eat hard bread any more. Look, Grandmother, look! Heidi unpacked her basket and piled the rolls in the Grandmother's lap. Ah, child, what a blessing you bring with you, she said, feeling the rolls, of which there seemed to be a countless number. But the greatest blessing is you yourself. And again she touched Heidi's hair and her hot cheek. But now, Heidi said, taking her Grandmother's hand, I must go home to Grandfather. Heidi said good night and went off up to the elm. The big snowfield sparkled in the evening sun. A red shimmer fell on the grass at Heidi's feet, and she turned round. She had not remembered, even in her dreams, how beautiful this picture was. The two peaks of the Falkness rose like twin flames. The snowfield was aglow, and above it floated rose-tinted clouds. Far below stretched the valley and above and around everything glittered and sparkled. Tears crept down Heidi's cheeks at the sight of all this splendour. Earnestly she pressed her hands together and thanked God for bringing her home again. Presently the tops of the fir trees, and then the hut, came into view, and there was the grandfather sitting on his bench and smoking his pipe, 
Heidi ran faster, and before the alm uncle was aware of anything, Heidi had thrown her basket to the ground and put her two arms round his neck, unable to say more than, Grandfather! 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 The old man could say nothing. For the first time for many years his eyes were wet with tears, and he brushed them roughly away with the back of his hand. Then he lifted Heidi onto his knee and looked at her. So you've come home again, Heidi, he began. Did they send you away? Oh, no, Grandfather, you mustn't think that. They were all very good to me, Clara and Grandmama and Herr Sessaman. It was just that I, I couldn't bear being away from you any longer. Sometimes I felt I would choke, but I never said anything because it would have been ungrateful. Then suddenly one morning Herr Sessaman called for me very early. I think maybe it was the doctor who told him, but perhaps it is all in the letter. And Heidi jumped down and fetched the letter and the little bag from her basket and handed them both to the grandfather. I think that belongs to you, he declared, laying the little leather bag beside him on the bench. Then he read the letter and without a word put it into his pocket. Do you think you could still drink milk with me? He asked Heidi and took her hand to go into the hut. But take your money. You can buy a proper bed with it and enough clothes to last several years. I don't need it, Grandfather, assured Heidi. I have a bed already and Clara packed such a lot of clothes in my trunk that I shall never have to buy any. Take the money and put it in the cupboard then. Some day you may want it. Heidi obeyed and followed the grandfather into the hut. Joyfully she ran about and looked into every corner. Then she took her old seat and eagerly drank her milk, as though nothing had ever tasted so delicious. Then she took a deep breath and declared, There is nothing in the whole wide world so good as our milk, grandfather. Suddenly a shrill whistle sounded. Quick as lightning, Heidi rushed outside, and there were the goats, skipping and jumping down the steep heights with Peter in their midst. Speechlessly he stared at Heidi. The little goats had evidently recognized her voice, for they rubbed their heads against her eagerly. Heidi was wild with joy to see her old companions once more, and called each one by name. Slowly Peter came towards her. "'I'm glad you're back.' said Peter, beaming with happiness, and began to urge the goats down the mountain. When Heidi got back into the cottage, her bed was already made up for her. With a sigh of contentment, she lay down and slept as she had not done for a whole year. During the night, the grandfather got up again and again, and listened anxiously to hear if Heidi slept quietly. But Heidi never stirred. Now there was nothing to make her wander about in the night time, for her longing was satisfied. She had seen the mountains again, and had heard the wind in the fir trees. She was home on the alm. Early next morning, the alm uncle stood in front of his hut, smiling gently as he looked around him. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, and he could hear the church bells ringing down in the valley. He went back into the hut, and called up to the loft. "'Get up, Heidi!' The sun has risen. Put on your nice frock, for we are going to church together this morning. When the grandfather and Heidi entered the church, the singing had already begun, so they sat down together at the back. But before the hymn was finished, there was subdued whispering on all sides. The alm uncle. Did you see the alm uncle? Soon everybody knew that the alm uncle was in church and the women, hardly able to believe, kept turning their heads to look. As soon as the service was finished, the old uncle walked with the child in the direction of the pastor's house. The uncle knocked at the door of the pastor's study, and the pastor greeted him as though he had expected the old man. His appearance in the church had not escaped the pastor's notice, and he shook hands warmly. At first the alm uncle could not find words, then, pulling himself together, he began, <clears throat> Pastor, I have come to ask you to forget the words I spoke to you on the alm, 
and not to hold it against me that I was too obstinate to take your well-meant advice. I see now that you were right and I was wrong. So I am following your advice, and I would like to take the house in Dorfley for the winter, for the cold season up there is not good for the child. She is too delicate. The kind eyes of the pastor brightened with joy. Neighbour, I am sincerely glad, and you will never have cause to regret coming back to live amongst us. You will always be welcome in my house, and I hope to spend many a pleasant winter evening with you, for I value your friendship. When they emerged from the pastor's house, they were assailed by friendly greetings. How nice to see you again, uncle. It's good to see you back, uncle. I've been wanting to have a talk with you for a long time. And when the uncle told them that he was going to live again in his old house in Dorfley for the winter months, there was such a chorus of joyful shouts that it seemed as though the alm uncle were the most popular person in Dorfley. Grandfather, Heidi said, as they climbed up the alm together, today you look nicer and nicer every minute. I have never seen you like this before. Do you think so? asked the old man, smiling. You see, Heidi, I am so happy today. To be at peace with God and man is good. God was good to me when he sent you to the elm. The September morning sky was all aglow, shedding its light upon the mountains, and a fresh breeze stirred in the fir trees, swaying their ancient branches. There came the sound of Peter's whistle, and presently Heidi was surrounded by the whole flock. Are you coming with us? he asked. No, Peter, I, I can't come today, replied Heidi, because my friend Clara is coming from Frankfurt, and I must be here to greet her. Peter turned at once and cracked his whip in the air, and the goats, who knew the sound well, started off up the mountain with Peter trotting after them. Heidi sat down for a minute and looked about her. The grandfather was working in the shed and came out from time to time to look smilingly at the child. He had just gone back to his work, when Heidi called out loudly, Grandfather! Grandfather! Come quickly! The old man came out at once, afraid that something had happened to the child. He saw Heidi running towards the path, calling as she went, They're coming! They're coming! The doctor has come too! He is first! Heidi rushed forward to welcome her old friend, who stretched out his hand in greeting. As soon as she reached him, she clasped his outstretched arm affectionately. Good morning, Doctor. I'm so grateful to you. God bless you, Heidi. And what is it you are grateful to me for? For arranging it so that I could come home, explained the child. With fatherly tenderness, the doctor took the child by the hand. Come, Heidi, take me to your grandfather and show me where you live. But Heidi did not go on. Her gaze was fixed on the path down the mountain, and her little face showed disappointment. Where are Clara and Grandmamma? she asked. I have something to tell you, Heidi, and I know you will be as sorry about it as I am, replied the doctor. You see, Heidi, I have come alone. Clara has been very ill and could not travel, so the Grandmamma did not come either. But in the spring, when the days begin to get warmer and longer, they will certainly come. Heidi looked perplexed. It was difficult for her to realise that everything she had looked forward to was not to be. Then it occurred to Heidi that, after all, the doctor had come, and she looked up at him. Oh, it won't be long until the spring, and then they'll be sure to come, won't they? she asked. The winter is never very long here, and when they do come, they will be able to stay much longer. Clara will certainly like that. Now let's go up to the grandfather. Hand in hand with the doctor, she climbed up to the cottage and called out cheerfully to the grandfather. They haven't come yet, but it won't be long. The doctor was no stranger to the grandfather, for Heidi had talked about him a great deal. The old man welcomed his guest heartily, and then the two men sat down on the bench before the cottage, and there was still a little place for Heidi beside the doctor. The doctor started to explain. Herr Sessamon wanted me to come, and I allowed myself to be persuaded, because I have not been well for quite a time, and I thought the fresh mountain air would do me good. The grandfather encouraged the doctor to spend the beautiful autumn days on the alm, 
or at least to come up every fine day. I cannot invite you to stay here, as I have no accommodation, but if you would take a room down in Dorfley, in the pleasant little inn, instead of going all the way back to Gradatz, you could come up here in the mornings. There are many places round about which I would take pleasure in showing you. This proposal delighted the doctor, and so it was settled. The doctor came up to the alm every morning. Sometimes he accompanied Heidi and Peter to the high pastures, and sometimes he went out with the alm uncle, whose conversation he enjoyed very much. For the old man knew the ways of all the wild animals, and had many interesting stories to tell. And so the lovely month of September passed. One morning the doctor did not look quite so happy as usual and told them that this would be his last day, and that he would have to return to Frankfurt. "'I'm very sad to go,' he admitted, "'for I feel now as if the alm were my home.' The alm uncle was sorry to hear this news of the doctor's departure, for he too had enjoyed his companionship. Heidi could hardly believe that her dear friend had to go, and she looked at him beseechingly, but the doctor's smile told her that his visit was at an end. She accompanied him a little of the way until the doctor stopped and said lovingly, stroking her curly hair, Heidi, I have to go away now. How I would love to take you with me to Frankfurt. Heidi recalled Frankfurt with its many houses and long streets. She remembered Fräulein Rotenmeier and Tinette and replied despondently, I would rather you came back to us. <laughs> you are right. That will be better said the doctor. Goodbye, then, Heidi. His kind eyes looked down on her for an instant, and then he turned away quickly and continued his walk down to the valley. Heidi stood and waved as long as he remained in sight. As he turned for the last time, he whispered to himself, It is good to live up there. One is restored, body and soul, and knows again what it is to be happy. The alm uncle kept his word, as soon as the first snows began to fall, he shut up the cottage and the shed and took Heidi and the goats down to Dorfley to live. Near the church stood a building which had, once upon a time, been a mansion house. Although it was now half in ruins, it still retained something of its former dignity. All this the uncle could fix, and when he had decided to spend the winter in Dorfley, he had come down many times in the autumn to repair the house. Then in October... He and Heidi had taken up their abode. Heidi attended school with Peter and visited the grandmother when the weather permitted. Thus the winter months passed quickly. In May, the last snow had melted and the golden sun had dried up the last traces of winter. Heidi was happy to be on the alm again and jumped about for joy. Once again she climbed daily with Peter and the goats up to the high pastures. May had passed and June was drawing to its close when one morning Heidi ran out of the hut. Just as she turned the corner, she gave a loud cry which brought the uncle hurrying to see what had happened. Grandfather! Grandfather! The child called excitedly. Come over here! Come and look! He came, and his eyes followed the direction of her outstretched arm. A strange procession could be seen coming up the mountain path. In front came two men carrying a sedan chair, in which a young girl sat, wrapped in many shawls. A horse followed, mounted by a stately lady, who looked about her with keen interest. Another man pushed an empty wheelchair, for it was easier and safer to carry the invalid up the mountain in the sedan. "'Here they are! Here they are!' cried Heidi joyfully. When the eagerly expected guests reached the arm, Heidi sprang forward, and the two children embraced each other lovingly. Grandmamma, too, was welcomed with the greatest affection." Then Grandmamma turned to the alm uncle, who came forward to bid them welcome. They all felt like old friends, as they had heard so much about each other. Grandmamma was delighted with the beautiful situation. And how well my little Heidi is looking, she remarked, patting the child's rosy cheeks. What do you think, Clara? Isn't it delightful here? Clara was entranced. Never in her life before had she seen or imagined anything so beautiful. Oh, how lovely it is! How I wish I could always live here, Grandmamma! 
Meantime, the uncle had pushed the invalid chair nearer, and now he suggested, "'Wouldn't it be better to put the little daughter into her accustomed seat?' And without waiting for assistance, he lifted Clara in his strong arms and very gently placed her in her own comfortable chair, putting some of the wraps over her knees and doing it all expertly, as if he had looked after invalids all his life. Grandmother was greatly impressed by his care and attention. With a great effort, Heidi succeeded in wheeling the chair onto the grass so that Clara could see the magnificent old fir trees which had gazed down for so many years on the valley below. Heidi opened the door of the goat house so that Clara could see inside. If only I could wait till Peter comes with the goats, Clara said regretfully. How I should love to see little swan and little bear. If we must always leave so early, as you say, Grandmamma, we shall never see them. My dear child, let us enjoy the things we can and not think of those we may miss. Oh, how pretty the flowers are. If only I could get up and pick some. Heidi ran and gathered a big bunch. But that is nothing, Clara, she said. If you come with us to the pasture, you will see ever so many. Heidi's eyes sparkled with longing to be able to show it all to her friend, and Clara's soft blue eyes reflected Heidi's enthusiasm. Grandfather had been busy preparing the meal, and he had brought the table and the chairs outside beside the bench. Soon the meal was ready, and the whole company sat down merrily. Grandmamma was delighted with this dining room under the blue sky, where she could sit and enjoy the magnificent view far down the valley. "'Is it really true?' she exclaimed when she saw Clara taking a second helping of toasted cheese, which she was eating with a great appetite. "'Yes, Grandmamma, mm, it tastes so good,' Clara assured her. "'That's right. Eat all you can,' encouraged the uncle. "'Our mountain air makes up for the deficiency of the kitchen.' Grandmamma and the uncle chatted together as though they had known each other for years. They had much in common, and the time passed quickly in lively conversation. But suddenly Grandmamma remembered. "'We will have to go presently, Sarah.' The sun will be going down soon, and the men with the chair will be here. The uncle looked at Grandmamma. I have an idea, he said. I think if we could agree to have your little granddaughter staying here with us for a while, she would be bound to get strong and well. With all the rugs you have brought, we could make a fine soft bed, and I myself would look after her. Clara and Heidi were as happy as two birds let out of their cage at this suggestion, and the grandmother's face beamed. "'My dear uncle, you are kindness itself,' she said. "'I have just been thinking how good a holiday so high up in the mountains would be for the child. But the nursing, the trouble and the inconvenience for you, and you make the offer as if it were nothing at all. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.' The old lady took his hand, and the uncle nodded happily. The grandfather thought four weeks would be just right to decide if the mountain air was agreeing with the child. And the prospect of being together for so long surpassed the children's expectations, and they both shouted for joy. The chair-bearers appeared at the cottage. They all said good-bye, and Grandmamma returned with the men down the mountain. The day closed for Clara with the most overwhelming experience of all. She lay in the big soft bed in the loft with Heidi near her, and looked through the round open window, right into the middle of the starlit sky. She had never been able to see the stars at home, because she had never been outside the house at night, and inside the heavy curtains were always drawn long before the stars came out. So she could not gaze long enough at the sparkling heavens, and lay looking out of the little round window, until at last her eyes closed of their own accord. The sun appeared in its full glory and flooded the rocks, woods and mountains with golden light when the uncle went back into the hut and quietly climbed up the little ladder. Clara had just opened her eyes and did not know at first where she was. Then she saw the sleeping Heidi beside her and heard the kindly voice of the grandfather whispering, Did you sleep well? Clara assured him that she had slept soundly all night. Now Heidi was awake and watched the grandfather carry Clara downstairs. Quickly she got up and dressed and ran down the ladder after them and out into the open air. A fresh breeze blew across the children's faces 
and Clara lay back in her chair with a feeling of comfort and health. Every breath was a joy in this pure mountain air. She had never imagined that the Alm could be so beautiful. Oh, Heidi, if only I could stay in the mountains with you always, she exclaimed. Do you understand now why I said the best place in the world is on the Alm with Grandfather? Just at that moment, the Grandfather appeared with two bowls of foaming milk. This will give you strength, he said to Clara. Clara had never tasted goat's milk before, and she smelt it first. But when she saw Heidi drinking hers to the last drop, she did the same. It tasted sweet and strong, as though it contained sugar and cinnamon. Soon her bowl was empty too. Clara and Heidi had so many plans that they hardly knew what to do first. The morning passed so quickly, the children were surprised to see the uncle bringing the lunch, which they took out of doors just as they had done the day before. In the afternoon they sat in the shadow of the fir trees, and Clara related all the things that had happened in Frankfurt since Heidi had left. Evening was approaching, and the goats came rushing down the mountain, their keeper following them, with not a very pleasant expression on his face. He did not even answer the children's friendly call, but went on chasing the goats. That night when they went to bed, Clara wanted to look up again at the stars, but her eyes would not stay open and she was soon fast asleep like Heidi, and slept as she had never done before in her life. So the days passed happily. Clara had now spent three weeks on the Alm. During the last few days, when Grandfather carried her downstairs to put her into her chair, he had asked her, Wouldn't the little daughter like to try to stand on the ground? Clara had always tried to please him, but had soon been forced to cry out, Oh, it hurts! and had clung to him, but each day he allowed her to stand just a little longer without her noticing. For years they had not had such a splendid summer on the Alm. Every day the sun shone brilliantly out of a cloudless sky. Heidi never tired of describing the high pasture to her friend, and finally the grandfather agreed to take Clara up the mountain. As soon as Heidi caught sight of Peter in the evening, she exclaimed, "'Peter! Peter!' "'Tomorrow we shall come up too, and stay all day on the pasture.' "'But Peter just grumbled like a bear in a temper. "'Early next morning the old man looked out to see what sort of day it would be. "'The dark shadows in the valley lifted, "'and gradually a rosy light spread across the mountains "'until above and below were bathed in colour. "'The sun had risen. "'The uncle brought the invalid chair from the shed "'and placed it in front of the house.' and then went inside to tell the children what a beautiful morning it was. Peter came lumbering up the hill. All the jealousy and temper in him had reached a climax. For weeks he had not had Heidi to himself. When he came in the morning, the strange child was carried out to her chair, and Heidi's attention was completely taken up with her. Not once, all during the summer, had Heidi come up to the pasture, and though she came today, she would still be accompanied by her friend and would still have no time for him. Peter anticipated this, and it made him quite wild with rage. There was no one about, and everything was quiet. Wildly he rushed forward, and seizing the chair, he pushed it with all his might down the slope. He pushed with such violence that it disappeared almost at once. Far below he saw it turn over and over, and fly into a hundred pieces. And now he thought of all the pleasant things for him which would result from the disaster. The stranger would have to leave, because she could not get about without her chair. Then Heidi would be free again to come with him up to the pasture. Everything would be as it had been in the days gone by. It did not occur to Peter that if we do something wrong, trouble is sure to follow. Presently Heidi came out and ran to the shed. The door was wide open. She looked everywhere, puzzled to know what had become of the chair. "'Did you move the chair, Heidi?' asked the grandfather. "'I've looked for it everywhere. You said it was by the door,' replied Heidi. The wind suddenly grew stronger and rattled the door of the shed, blowing it back against the wall with a bang. "'Grandfather, it, it must have been the wind,' called Heidi. "'Oh!' If it has blown the chair down the valley, 
we will never get it back in time. If it has rolled as far as that, we will never get it back at all, said the grandfather. By now it will be in a thousand pieces. And he went round the corner of the hut to look down the path. Now we can't go, lamented Clara. We will go today as we intended, replied the uncle. Then we shall see what else can be done. The children were delighted. The uncle went back into the hut and brought out some of the rugs. I wonder why the boy is not here yet, thought the uncle. He picked up Clara, and carrying her on one arm and the rugs on the other, he said, Now, let's be off. The goats will come with us. With one arm round little Swan's neck and the other round little Bear's, Heidi walked behind the grandfather. When they arrived on the pasture, they saw here and there on the slopes goats peacefully grazing, and in the midst of them on the ground Peter was lying. I'll teach you to pass my house another time, you lazy fellow, called the uncle. What does this mean? Peter shot up at the sound of the familiar voice. There was nobody up, he answered. The uncle said no more, but spread the rugs on the sunny slope and set Clara down upon them, asking if she was comfortable. Enjoy yourselves, he said. In the evening I will come back to fetch you. Now I must go and look for the chair and see what has happened to it. The children had never been so happy together. The goats would gather round them in a friendly way, and they had even got to know Clara well enough to rub their heads affectionately against her shoulder. So the hours went by, and Heidi thought she would like to go to her favourite spot where the flowers grew so profusely. "'You must come and see it,' she said to her friend. "'The flowers are so beautiful now, and in the evening they may have changed. I, I can carry you. Don't you think, Clara?' Clara shook her head. "'No, Heidi. You are much smaller than I. Oh, if only I could walk!' Heidi called to Peter, and together they lifted Clara and held her up between them. But they did not get on very well. Clara was not light, and the team was too unequal, down on one side and up on the other. "'Put your foot down firmly,' Heidi suggested. "'Do you think?' Clara hesitated, but she obeyed, and ventured first one step on the ground, and then another. The pain made her moan a little. Then she put a foot out again, and cried joyfully that it was less painful already.' "'Try again,' urged Heidi, eagerly. Clara went on trying, again and again, and suddenly she exclaimed, "'I can do it, Heidi. Oh, I can! Look, I can make steps, one after the other. "'Can you really walk now? If only Grandfather were here,' cried Heidi. Clara had still to hold on to both Peter and Heidi, but with every step she felt safer. Heidi was quite beside herself with joy. Now we will be able to come here every day, and you will be able to walk like me, and you will be healthy. It was not far to the slope where the beautiful flowers grew. The children could already see the yellow and blue patches. Soon they reached it. They sat down in the midst of the flowers. Heidi thought she had never seen it so beautiful before. Clara was silent, overcome with happiness at the beauty around her and the wonderful prospect which had opened up before her, the joy of being able to walk about like other people. Peter was quiet too and lay quite still on the ground. When the grandfather appeared, climbing up the slope, Heidi rushed towards him to tell him the good news. The grandfather's face brightened and he smiled happily at Clara. You have made the effort and you have won, he said. He lifted Clara up into his arms. We mustn't overdo it, he said. In any case, it is time to go home. As the children lay in bed that night, looking out at the stars, Heidi said, I've been thinking all day how good it is that God does not give us just what we ask. He always knows of something better for us. Why do you think that, Heidi? asked Clara. Because... When I was in Frankfurt, 
I prayed to be allowed to go home at once, and when it did not happen, I thought God did not hear. But you see, if I had run away at once, you would never have come here, and would never have got well. Every day walking became easier and less painful for Clara, and longer walks were undertaken. The exercise gave her such an appetite that the grandfather had to cut the bread a little thicker every day, and he was very pleased when he saw it disappearing. So another week went by, and then came the day the grandmother was to return for Clara. Heidi tidied the hut in preparation for the grandmamma's arrival. When everything was in order, the children sat down on the bench outside the cottage, ready to welcome her. The grandfather came and sat down beside them. He held in his hands a lovely bunch of gentians, which he had picked that morning. Soon they saw a group of people toiling up the mountain path. First there came a guide, and then a white horse on which rode the grandmamma, and last of all a porter with grandmamma's luggage. At last the procession arrived, and the old lady caught sight of the children. Clara, is this really you? she exclaimed. Your cheeks have become quite round and rosy. I hardly recognize you, child. She came forward to embrace Clara, but Heidi quickly slipped from the bench, and with Clara leaning on her shoulder, they walked slowly towards the grandmamma. The old lady stood transfixed. Then she embraced her little grandchild, then Heidi, then Clara again. She gazed at them both speechlessly. At last she saw the alm uncle who had been watching the proceedings with a broad smile. With Clara on her arm, she walked with her to the bench, and, letting Clara sit down, she grasped the old man's hand. My dear uncle, how can I thank you? This is your doing, your care and nursing. And God's sunshine and mountain air, interrupted the grandfather, smiling. And also little swan's good milk put in Clara. Grandmamma, you should have seen how much milk I've been drinking. I can see it, Clara, by your cheeks. What a change! You have become plump and strong, and taller too. I simply cannot take my eyes off you. We must send a telegram to your father in Paris. He must come home at once, but I shan't tell him why. This will be the most wonderful surprise he has ever had. In Paris, Herr Sessamon had finished his business, and he also had a surprise in store. Without giving any warning, he took the train to Basel, for he had a great longing to see his little daughter, from whom he had been separated all summer. He arrived at Ragatz a few hours after his mother's departure, and this fitted in nicely with his plans. He took a coach to Meinfeld, where he learned that he could drive as far as Dorfli. The climb from there seemed to him very long and fatiguing, but at last his goal came in sight. There stood the alm hut. Herr Sessamon joyfully climbed the last steep path. Before he had reached the top, he was recognized by the party outside the cottage, and quickly a surprise was prepared for him. As he left the path to approach the hut, two figures came towards him. A tall girl with fair hair and rosy cheeks leaned on her smaller companion. Herr Sessamon stood still and stared at them. Papa, don't you know me? called Clara. Have I changed so much? At once Herr Sessamon rushed to embrace his little daughter. Yes, you have changed indeed. Is it possible? Can this be my little Clara? he exclaimed repeatedly. Grandmamma had come forward. My dear son, what do you think of this? she cried. You had prepared a pleasant surprise for us, but I think we have an even pleasanter one for you. But now you must meet the alm uncle, who is our greatest benefactor. Gladly, and also our dear little Heidi, replied Herr Sessamon, shaking hands with Heidi. I don't need to ask if you are well and happy. No alpine rose could look more blooming. Then the grandmamma led her son to the alm uncle. As the two men shook hands, Herr Sessamon expressed his heartfelt thanks and his great astonishment at the miracle. The grandfather prepared a simple lunch under the trees, and there was much laughter as Heidi and Clara told Grandmamma and Herr Sessamon all that had happened during the past four weeks. 
They were enjoying themselves so much that Heidi and Clara forgot that it would soon be time to say goodbye again. After the meal, Herr Sessermann went to the Almuncle and, seizing his hand, said, My dear friend, let us have a word together. Believe me when I say that for years I have not known such happiness. Money and possessions have meant nothing to me since they have not helped to make my poor child well and happy. You have restored her health and given new life to her and me. Now tell me, how can I show my gratitude? I can never repay what you have done, but whatever is in my power is at your disposal. Tell me, my friend, what can I do? The Almuncle had listened in silence. Now he looked at Herr Sessermann and smiled. Believe me, Herr Sessermann, I too am overjoyed at the girl's recovery on our alm, and my trouble has been well repaid by that. For your kind offer I thank you, but there is nothing I need. As long as I live, I have enough for Heidi and myself. But if one wish only could be fulfilled, I should have no more worries in this life. Speak, my friend, urged Herr Sessermann. I am old, continued the uncle, and cannot expect to be here much longer. When I have passed away, there will be nothing for the child, and she has no relatives of any account. If you will promise that Heidi will never have to go out and earn her living amongst strangers, then you will have amply repaid what I have done for your child. But there could never be any question about it, exclaimed Herr Sesemann. The child is one of us. Ask my mother and my daughter. They will never allow Heidi to go to strangers. This I promise you, both during my life and after. The child will never have to go among strangers. She has made good friends, one of whom is our friend, the doctor. He is winding up his affairs and intends to come and settle here this autumn in the Swiss mountains, for he has never felt so well and happy as in your and the child's company. You see, Heidi will now have two protectors. May they both live long. God grant that that will be so, added the grandmamma, and shook hands warmly with the almuncle. Then she embraced Heidi, who stood beside her. Clara was very sad about leaving the alm, where she had been so happy. But Heidi did her best to comfort her. Summer will soon come again, and then it will be better still, for you are well now, and we can go every day with the goats up to the pastures. Clara dried her tears. Don't forget to remember me to Peter and the goats, she said. Herr Sessermann was beckoning to the children, for it was time to go. Heidi stood at the very edge of the slope and waved to Clara until she disappeared from sight. The doctor arrived in Dorfley, and, on the Alm uncle's advice, he bought the house where the old man and Heidi had stayed during the winter. The doctor decided to have it rebuilt, part of it for himself, and the other part for the uncle and Heidi for their winter lodgings. As the days went by, the doctor and the Alm uncle became very good friends, and often their conversation would turn to Heidi, because, for both of them, it was the greatest joy to have the child with them in their new house. One day, when the doctor and the uncle were standing together, seeing how the new building was getting on, the doctor said to the old man, I share your happiness in the child, and I feel I am nearest to her after you. So I want to share also the responsibilities, and to provide for her as best I can so that I may hope that in my old age she will stay with me. That is my greatest wish, that Heidi should have the same claims on me as though she were my own child. Then we will be able to leave her free of worries when you and I have departed. The grandfather pressed the doctor's hand, and the doctor could read in the eyes of his friend how greatly touched he was by these words. 